thank you um, for staying on and staying sharp and awake for this session. Um, given the fact that we are running short of time, uh, I would just simply um, not uh, recapitulate what this session is about, but you can see what the, the title is uh, self-evident, uh, Exile and the Return of the Avant-Garde, um, 1937 to 1955. Well, this not only refers to uh, the very uh, outline of this uh, exhibition proposal that Sabina Brantel laid out this morning, but also it relates very much to uh, Benjamin Buckler's talk, um, keynote speech this morning, you know, sort of helping us um, understand the important tension and the entanglement between uh, different ideas of modernism or the entanglement between modernism and modernity, I believe, you know, Christian Feynman, you know, sort of tried to make that distinction um, in terms of um, um, the, the extension between modernism and modernity. But what is very crucial uh, for this session is the fact that there were, you know, not only just simply degenerate art exhibitions, um, many of which uh, had preceded the one that happened in Munich in 1937. There were earlier degenerate art exhibitions going back to uh, 33 in Hamburg and in, you know, Nuremberg and other parts of Germany. We had originally intended to include uh, this aspect in the exhibition, but we didn't. Uh, while those exhibitions had to do specifically with artworks that were confiscated from various locations, one of the important consequences of that is the dislocation of artists. The movement, the depopulation, if you will, of uh, the artistic avant-garde from Europe um, that intensified and led, of course, to the exile of many artists to the United States, to Latin America and other parts of the world. This is a very important aspect of our reflection uh, today and to help us sort of think um, many of the questions through um, is a panel of um, very you know, distinguished uh, historians who in many ways um, have um, contributed to enlarging the, the subject um, um, of the uh, avant-garde modernism and the pre- and post-war period. Of course, post-war here, taking the term advisedly from Mark Wigley, um, that we are mentioning is really has to do with the um, you know, Second World War. So um, we will go chronologically. So let, you know, we'll begin with you know, Karen Fiss, um, who is Associate Professor at California College of Arts in San Francisco. Uh, you know, Karen received her doctorate from Yale University and, um, and it currently teaches uh, in the Visual Studies, Architecture, and Des in Design um, in departments at the California College of Arts in San Francisco. Her current research examines the history of nation branding, I like that term very much, in the production of visual culture, uh, from the rise of the nation state to its role in shaping the contemporary social artistic um, and built environment of emerging economies. So in, in, in other words, not only the combination of design and statecraft somehow intertwined. Uh, Fis is serving as the film curator um, for the exhibition Encounters with the 1930s, uh, opening at the, um, at the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid uh, later this year in October. And her most recent publication, which for me, again, offers a very, very thorough analysis of the intersection of Hauser Kunst and uh, the, uh, the international uh, context of nation branding in the, in, in the 30s. It's called Grand Illusion, the Third Reich, and the, the Paris Exposition and the Cultural Seduction of France. This was published in 2009, I believe, from Yale University Press, or Chicago, from Chicago. Um, and demonstrates, this book sort of demonstrates how cultural exchange between France and Germany in the 1930s served to normalize aspects of fascist ideology in France and helped lay the groundwork for the country's eventual collaboration with its uh, German occupiers uh, in the 30s, I suppose, the Vichy, 
you know, period. Uh, Fils has also recently co-edited a special volume of the journal Design Issues on Globalization, Postcolonialism, and Design, and has contributed essays to numerous publications, including art, culture, and media under the Tech Reich, Design and Ethics, in addition to many other scholarly publications. Um, to um, Karen's right is uh, Walter Grasskamp. Let me first um, um, you know, apologize at, you know, to, to Walter because I've been remiss in mentioning the fact over the last you know, few days that the genesis of this conference um, you know, came out of uh, the discussions that we had with Walter and that Walter is also very deeply involved in the thinking and the planning of the two-day symposium, especially uh, today, and had really many uh, important recommendations of, um, of in, 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 in invitees. So uh, again, apologies, Walter, for, uh, for, for this remiss, but uh, we, I'm very pleased that you, you're um, here with us. Um, to contribute. So Walter Grasskamp, um, for many people here in Munich and elsewhere, needs no introduction. He's an art historian, um, you know, critic and professor of art history at Munich's uh, Academy of Fine Arts. Um, and following his study in art history and philosophy, literature and sociology in Cologne, Consuls and Aachen, um, uh, Grasskamp worked as a critic for radio, newspapers and on magazines. He has taught as professor at the Technical College in Münster and then at the Academy of Finance in Munich, where uh, until uh, 2003 he was the deputy rector. Uh, Walter has published on several you know, subjects, including art in public space. And um, okay, this is where my German, uh, you know, it will be. <laughs> sorely tested, um, but uh, he's published Uber Kunst and, and Politik, 1995, and Modernism, well, this one you have to really say yourself, Walter, from 1989, uh, <laughs> as well as, you know, um, <clears throat> histories of museums, so I, I, I deeply apologize because I don't want to really massacre the titles of these very, very important books. Um, Benjamin uh, needs no introduction, he's already been introduced, and thank you, Benjamin, for joining us uh, for this session. So we'll kick off with Karen, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity after their presentations to engage in a conversation. Uh, so help me welcome the panelists. Anyway, I just briefly want to say thank you for the introduction and particularly for the invitation. Uh, selfishly, the conference and the two exhibits uh, really feeds right into my current book project. Uh, and uh, so it's been really stimulating and it's caused me to ask myself a lot of questions. Um, and although what I've been asked to speak on today actually comes from former work of mine, uh, the book that Oakley mentioned, uh, Grand Illusion. Um, and so what I was asked to do was actually give the Haus der Deutschen Kunst a historical context at the Paris World's Fair uh, of 1937. So that is in fact what I'm speaking about um, briefly today in my 15 minutes. Um, but I'm hoping that we might have time in the discussion uh, to get at some of the issues that came about um, at the end of the last uh, session, uh, particularly around what might, what might call a state of exceptionalism that is often applied to the way that uh, Nazi culture is uh, framed historically, artistically, and through exhibitions. Um, maybe get back to what Mark uh, so eloquently addressed in terms of a dialectic of closeness and distance in thinking through these issues, uh, or what Georges uh, posed also as a dialectic that we should think through of sentimentality and abstraction. And I would like to add uh, the status of metaphor and metonymy in a relationship to experience design and the experience economy, which I think Benjamin's uh, talk, which brought together two very interesting exhibitions uh, and in a very provocative way, I think, dealt with. 
but mostly about uh, thinking through the conditions of spectatorship in relationship to spectacle, obviously, to scopic pleasure, and I'll add banality, because I think actually what I'm sensing, not just here, but in the conferences I've been involved in recently uh, regarding Nazi culture, or in a broader sense, uh, the uh, politics of the 1930s, which engages the exhibition I'm working on for the Reina Sofia, um, that we're actually redefining banality um, in a way that I think is uh, very concerning um, and differs quite a bit from the point at time it was raised by Hannah Arendt in a work that I still feel has a lot of relevance uh, today. So anyway, I'll get to my actual talk now, <laughs> um, which I guess again following uh, Benjamin's really provocative, uh, I think an important lead, looks at another aspect of uh, a Franco-German juxtaposition. And it starts here. Uh, the German participation at the 1937 Paris Exposition uh, was actually the most extensive and the most expensive of any foreign nation participating at the fair. And its pavilion, which I'm showing you, was designed by Albert Speer and commanded a central position on the Avenue of Peace across from the pavilion of the Soviet Union. And this infamous confrontation uh, you can see here from the steps of the Trocadero. At the far end of the German pavilion's long exhibition hall, visitors encountered a flight of stairs leading ceremoniously to the podium of honor, upon which truce large model for the Haus der Deutschen Kunst was on display. Speer's building, as Sabina mentioned this morning, opened just a few weeks after construction was completed on the museum and a few weeks before the opening of its first exhibition of great German art. So for the purposes of my brief talk this morning, I'm actually going to function, uh, focus on the function of the Haus der Deutschen Kunst within the larger iconography of the pavilion, particularly in the terms of the way that technology and culture were mediated under national socialism, a tension seemingly reconciled and made productive by the Third Reich through what I'm calling an aesthetic overproduction of traditional aesthetic forms. The link between the two buildings was made clear in the introduction to the German pavilion catalog, which juxtaposed a photograph of Hitler and Speer admiring a model for the pavilion with one of Hitler with the pavilion's interior architect, Waldemar Brinkmann, examining in a sort of mise en abime a miniaturized model of the Haus der Deutschen Kunst contained within a sectional view of the podium. Within the cultic atmosphere of the pavilion, the podium of honor, illuminated by a large stained glass window, functioned spatially like an altar, and the model of the Haus der Deutschen Kunst, with its marble base encircled by potted flowers, was presented much like a body lying in state, solemnly commemorating the death of Troost, Hitler's beloved architect, as well as dramatically accentuating the quasi-religious significance bestowed on art and architecture by the Nazis. The privileging of supposedly timeless and traditional values in Nazi art served one of the two primary agendas for the Nazi participation, as the regime strove to impress international audiences with Germany's revitalized national spirit and corresponding cultural renaissance. According to the official catalog, the pavilion's objective was, quote, to show something of the soul of the country, bearing witness to its artistic endeavors and reflecting the strength and character of the entire nation. But just as important, the German pavilion, like all pavilions at World's Fairs, was intended to sell products. To hawk all kinds of Germany, German luxury commodities, 
China, jewelry, silver, but mostly consumer and industrial technology, cameras, medical equipment, transmitters, motors, etc. The bald pursuit of commercial trade opportunities, however, created an ideological paradox for the Reich, for Nazi leaders consistently attacked international commerce, associating it with the so-called Jewish preoccupation with finance. Furthermore, the Reich had declared autarky as a goal of the four-year plan, yet needed foreign credit to acquire the raw materials it needed for its extensive rearmament campaign. Defending the primacy of the state over individual commercial interests, Wilhelm Lotz, a prominent architectural critic and the editor at the time of the journal uh, Schönheit der Arbeit, argued in the pavilion catalog that the quote, dignified arrangement did not lure people into some cheap show, but rather revealed the soul of the German nation. The rhetorical maneuver was intended to distance the Nazi display of commodities from the quintessential icon of capitalist exchange, the modern department store, characterized as a decadent and parasitic Jewish enterprise. The catalog further noted that the pavilion clearly demonstrated that the Third Reich had nothing to do with selfish individual interests, but rather made paramount the well-being of the community. Quote, the Great Hall creates the effect of a unit the individual departments are not in competition with each other. They are all housed under the same roof, organized according to the will of one man, united in the ideal of the community of the German people, witnesses of the new Germany and its Führer. The reconciliation of the national socialist economic agenda and its purported anti-capitalist ideology required more than anything the transformation of the very notions of what constituted technology, labor, and industrial production. As Jeffrey Herf has demonstrated, reactionary modernists separated technology from a rationalized economic sphere and recast it in biological and spiritual terms. According to this logic, the Nazis could pursue technological progress while still claiming to be a community of non-alienated labor though in reality, they were destroying trade unions and pushing industrial efficiency and tailorized production to new extremes. Visually within the pavilion, the unstable foundation of Nazi ideology was masked through a strategy of aesthetic overproduction, a plethora of overdetermined representations and symbols that enabled the regime to make paradox a productive principle to sustain the oxymoronic tensions necessary to achieve its economic and political goals while projecting a totalized image of the Reich. Images of non-alienated labor and idyllic leisure permeated the pavilion, such in, as in these uh, immense mosaics installed opposite each other in the exhibition hall. And just for scale, I should mention that these are about three or four times human, human height, or average human height. In an age of industrial sophistication, the emphasis on traditional craft was supposed to serve as a kind of guarantor for the purity and immutability of the German soul. The exiled photographer and writer Giselle Freund, writing for a French art journal, art journal referred to the pavilion's decor as having created, quote, a symbolic cocoon through a reliance on erratic media such as oil paint, mosaics, and stained glass. Freund asserts that the Germans were at their core a, quote, material people who needed to idealize matter, to favor myth over mimesis, and therefore avoided more ephemeral media, such as photography and photomontage, which dominated other pavilions at the fair. And while Freund incorrectly assumed that the absence of photographic murals in the German pavilion reflected a general rejection of the medium by the Nazis, which of course was hardly the case, as photography and montage were extensively used in many other propaganda exhibitions, she does rightly discern the desire to create an insular and self-generating web of signification at the fair. When compared to the interior of the Soviet pavilion, for example, with its oversized wall text, electrified maps, photo murals, and modernistic architectural elements, 
the 19th century bourgeois ornateness of the German pavilion with its densely patterned wallpaper, heavy chandeliers, and inlaid vitrines appears deliberately antiquated. On the other hand, Soviet machinery, as exemplified by the ZIS automobile at the center of the hall, appears aesthetically and technologically retrograde when compared to the sleek aerodynamic lines uh, of the 16-cylinder Mercedes racing car. This comparison points to a significant intersection regarding the fate of vanguard aesthetics in the, late, in the late 1930s and its role within the dialectic of technology and culture under national socialism. As has been argued for some time now, modernist aesthetics were not eradicated under national socialism, but rather shifted pragmatically to various industrial and technological spheres. In the displays at the 1937 pavilion, it was an ideological maneuver akin to l'art pour l'art that unhinged technology from its political and economic context, allowing beauty and efficiency to become ends in themselves. The aesthetic qualities of German technology at the fair were not lost on French audiences. As the full page photographs by Hugo Herdeg, published in Cahiers d'Art, attest. Herdeg photographed German machinery at the fair which was displayed on podiums like sculpture. He also photographed displays of German technology for a book about modernist architecture at the Paris Fair, published by Jean Badovici. Who was the editor of Architecture Vivante, a friend of, a friend of Le Corbusier, and a strong advocate of modernism. And according to Badovici, the technology displays at the Paris Exposition were designed for the Third Reich by Mies van der Rohe, and an attribution that, if accurate, would further assure their modernist credentials. The framing of technology's supposedly newly won autonomy proved effective in neutralizing potentially more ominous associations. Nowhere in the French press was the exhibited German technology whether the steel foundry equipment by Krupp we saw just uh, before, or chemical synthetics, or the production of synthetic rubber by IG Farben, none of these were connected to their utility in, rearm in rearmament or war. As one writer for the French radical socialist organ Love wrote of the pavilion's exhibition, quote, the magnificent pavilion is an imposing manifestation of the civilizing energies of Germany. The Third Reich has cast off its warrior gear and is talking to the world through the voices of its intellectuals, engineers, and artists. Presiding over the pavilion's exhibition hall then, the model for the Haus der Deutschen Kunst served to simultaneously illustrate the deeply material nature of Germany's artistic production, one rooted in the blood and soil of the folk, as well as to authenticate the nation's anti-materialism in an economic sense, its regeneration in the model of a pre-industrial holistic Gemeinschaft. Truce model shared the podium with a tapestry made after Adolf Ziegler's The Four Elements, which obviously one can see upstairs, uh, the original in the exhibition, and also Hengstenberg's large painting entitled Comradeship, in which the figure of the architect clearly functioned allegorically as a leader. His workers brought harmoniously into meaningful collaborative labor under his will. Hitler's image, however, was in fact absent from the pavilion. There were no stately painted portraits or other kinds of images. He was absent and yet omnipresent, for according to the catalog, his spirit supposedly infused uh, all the exhibitions throughout the hall. But to fully understand the supplemental dynamic of technology and culture within the pavilion, one must also pay heed to what lay beneath the model of the Haus der Deutschen Kunst, below the podium honor, below the podium of honor upon which it was displayed. For occupying this space was the pavilion cinema where over 100 German newsreels, documentaries, and feature films were screened twice daily 
in different cura curated programs. The third Rice film exhibit was far more extensive than any other participating nation at the fair, including the US and the Soviet Union and uh, other major film producers. And it also included the French premieres of such films as Der Herrscher and Triumph of the Will. So next to the Kino were two exhibitions about television. An interactive television phone and an experimental broadcasting system through which sound films were shown alternately with scenes of the fair shot from the pavilion's rooftop garden. Moving from the exhibition hall then to the television rooms and the cinema, we thus transition from the cultural mediation of technology to the technological mediation of culture. For it's this relationship that most clearly links Nazism with the historical avant-garde's efforts to sustain its revolutionary claims. Technology emerged as a pivotal factor in the avant-garde's fight against an aestheticist modernism by focusing on new modes of perception. Though it's the reactionary modernists who aspired more than anyone to the dream of a vanguardist mass culture, to harnessing its affective, aesthetic, and economic potential. This is where Nazi culture excelled, in culture produced for collective reception, to saturate everyday life, or staged as an event to be experienced, whether in film, in elaborate art and industry exhibits, or in choreographed mass pageantry. As one French critic noted when reviewing German films at the Paris Fair, he said, it's not a question of whether Monsieur Hitler is greater than Napoleon or Bismarck, as he himself claims, but he is certainly just as strong as Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. But to return and end with the Haus der Deutschen Kunst, the museum was no exception to the technological determinism of collective reception. For its ideological role within the new Nazi state was mediated from the moment its cornerstone was laid in 1933. And again, this has obviously come up in several uh, presentations today. And this was done through documentaries, newsreels, broadcast speeches, public festivals, and the parades. These representations made much of the timelessness and endurance of stone. But really, the museum asserted its authority most powerfully as a stage set. The building itself premeditated and seamlessly integrated the technology necessary for generating its own mediascape. The Haus der Deutschen Kunst, as Chris Durkan mentioned in his presentation, possessed a state-of-the-art stereophonic broadcast system, placing it among the earliest institutions to use this technology. The Ehrenhalle was used as a speaking platform for the broadcast center, from which the opening ceremonies and the speeches of Hitler and other party officials for the Große Deutsche Kunstausstellung were transmitted. And I also mentioned to Mark during the, I guess the lunch break, um, that in a sense I consider both the German pavilion and this museum to be kinds of what I'd call an ar architectural cyborgs, that uh, there's a steel infrastructure and state-of-the-art air conditioning and heating system, which Christian Fürmeister has shared his knowledge with me about that. Um, so again, this, uh, this notion of a stage set, I think, uh, relates to that cyborg type of uh, uh, vision of, of this fusing of uh, modernistic structural elements and, uh, again, this purported timeless uh, and uh, material uh, architectural form. Anyway, so while Nazi ideologues uh, relied heavily on this discourse that elevated classically inspired high art and architecture, using it to stabilize the oxymoronic underpinnings of a reactionary modernist ideology, they already understood in a very sophisticated way that what really mattered was how the object was branded, shot through with spectacle in order to break down divisions between public and private, product and client. The highly sophisticated coordination of all these facets of Nazi culture allowed the Third Reich to rapidly accelerate the process of inculcating national and consumer loyalty. The German pavilion, in many respects, is a microcosm of this strategy 
its multi-platform branding tactics literalized in the spatial divisions of the pavilion, gathered under one roof to impress a world audience, as well as its citizens back home. Despite the appearance of windowless containment and hermeticism, its mediation assured that the German pavilion's messaging reached far and wide. Thank you. Does he have to come up? Yes. Um, for the technical break, I can abuse the situation to speak out an invitation for tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon, Hans Hake will give a lecture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, a place you all know. He was invited by the students, and we feel honored that he accepted that invitation to speak at about 7 p.m., um, giving a lecture that has the title no title. You are cordially invited to join us in the Aula, the historical Aula of the Academy of Fine Arts tomorrow at 7 p.m. And I may add, admission is free. Um, many thank yous have been spoken out to the organizers um, of this symposium, to the invitations um, that have been given. I want to add a very special Thank you to uh, you, Okwi, and to Sabine Brantl. And this is a thank you for giving a good example by stressing the importance of the archive for the Haus der Kunst. The work of the archivist is often used, but rarely praised. But any art historian knows how much we depend on the work of the archive. I know about the efforts, the enormous efforts Sabine Brantl has taken to document, publish, and comment the history of the Haus der Kunst and to prepare this exhibition. And I'm grateful also that Okwi, as far as I, understand, as I understand it, is planning to give the archive a permanent space in the exhibition field and not only in the cellar where normally the archives are situated. So, Giving an example for a permanent archive in the exhibition space and for a permanent archivist, I'm very grateful because I stress this point because I'm fighting for years for the Academy to follow this example. So thank you for giving a good example that I can refer to. <laughs> that archive work is worth a permanent effort. Um, my statement has um, four small chapters. The first chapter is called um, The Return of the Avant-Garde in Masquerade. The second is called The Avant-Garde as Academy. The third is called Of Missing Persons. And the fourth is called Purification. What you see here on the wall is a wall in the entrance hall of the first documenta in 1955. What we see is the left wall, and this is the wall on the right-hand side. It's an astonishing entrance hall for an exhibition of modern art, because the posters on the wall do not show any art of the 20th century to which the documenta officially was dedicated. They show sculptures, objects, and paintings instead from nearly every continent and of many different periods, except for the era of European modernism. The visitors of the first documenta first ran into masks from Africa, archaic marbles from ancient Greece, pre-Columbian sculptures from Mexico, medieval reliefs from Switzerland, prehistoric cave paintings, Byzantine mosaics, altogether quite astonishing a party of images and objects for a modern art exhibition. We see in enlargement an Assyrian cylinder seal. You have noticed this Byzantine mosaic on the left wall. And we see my favorite piece, medieval capital from Payan, showing the Madonna. <laughs> 
If the curators of the first documenta did not yet regard photography as art, they definitely regarded cave paintings, pre-Columbian sculptures, or African masks as works of art. Even more so, they regarded them as belonging to the same kin as modern art. If these works of art were not modern themselves, to assemble them here on the walls of the entrance hall, of course, was a very modern way to look at art as a notion. To backdate modern art for many thousand years was not invented in Kassel, of course, but already had come into fashion in post-war Western Europe. One of the most important manifestations of this fashion certainly was Ludwig Goldscheider's famous book, 5,000 Years of Modern Art, that was published in English and German, and this is the German cover for the double-languaged edition that had appeared in London in 1952, three years before the first documenta. Another one was the exhibition of 40,000 years of modern art, shown at the ICA in London in 1949. Obviously, it was difficult at the time to exactly say how old modern art was. The curators of the first documenta may not have been informed about these broad-minded backdatings in London, but they certainly knew about the ICA engagement. The ICA catalogue, 40,000 Years of Modern Art, was prefaced by Herbert Reed, one of the most important post-war publicists in the field of modern art, and he was among the lecturers in the frame program of the first documenta. Definitely, the curators knew about another manifestation of this fashion of backdating modern art, and that is the Musée Imaginaire of André Malraux. We see here the famous photo by Maurice Jarnoux that was taken in the spring of 1954. Malraux's Musée Imaginaire was one of the most influential manifestations of art's presumed universality in time and space, a questionable concept still virulent today in the guise of world art or global art. We see Malraux here not in the position of the Lord of the Rings, but of the Lord of the Images. As Georges Didier Hubermont pointed out yesterday, he's in the position that world art belongs to him. The entrance hall, in fact, is a local branch of Malraux's Musée Imaginaire. The museum without walls displayed on walls, so to speak. I'm not sure if Malraux visited the castle branch of his enterprise, but he must have known about it. Because the three pictures that I showed you isolated from the walls were selected by one of the curators, Arnold Bode, from Malraux's books. The documenta obviously received the copies from the archives of Malraux's publishing house, Gallimard, otherwise, it would not have been possible to enlarge them as posters in the brilliance needed to decorate the hall. Backdating modern art for thousands, if not ten thousands of years, demonstrated an anthropological turn in art history, in art theory, sorry. I know well that the battle hymn in the humanities currently is turn, turn, turn. Somebody should write a new verse for Pete Seegers and the Bird's famous song, turn, 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 so I hesitate to call this an anthropological turn. But I'm not promoting a new method. I'm only trying to find a name for a prominent shift in art theory in the early 20th century. Anthropological turn is a notion already common in theology, the study of literature, or historical science. There is no turn left unturned in the humanities. But as far as I can see, it has not yet been applied for the change in art theory I'm talking about, for which it would be most suitable. And that is the post-war tendency to appropriate images worldwide and throughout history in defense of modernism. The anthropological turn in art theory had its own sources, its own history, dating back into the late, late 19th century as the Munich art historian Ulrich Pfisterer has convincingly, convincingly summarized recently in the book World Art Studies, edited by Kitty Seilmans and Wilfried van Damme. In this turn, 
any image of some iconographical standard was adopted as art, wherever or whenever it had been produced, whatever it had, it had meant, or whatever it had served for. That, of course, blurred historical, cultural, and geographical differences in favor of a notion of art as an anthropological constant, which I doubt it is. But it was a nice idea at the time, and it came in handy when arguments in favor of modern art were desperately needed. So it corrupted nearly every intellectual engaged in the defense of modern art, and what a great time it must have been for people like us when modern art still needed to be defended. In Kassel, this anthropological review in the entrance hall was used as a preface for the exhibition on the 20th century art with Roman numerals. The posters were meant to attune the German visitors to the exhibition and to prepare them for the artistic innovations to come in the halls of the Museum Fredericianum, modernist in innovations they only 10 years before had been expected to regard as degenerate. Thus, it was an entrance hall with a thesis. The photographs were not assembled here to illustrate that historic and prehistoric images had influenced modern art. They were assembled here to evoke an anthropological continuity of the expressive, if not expressionist, image making throughout all ages and all cultures. And that is what Didi Übermont called yesterday Malraux's family of art. As an anthropological pedigree of modern art, this Musée Imaginaire in Kassel was meant to baffle any enemy of modernism. The posters enforced the legitimacy of expressive and expressionistic qualities in modern art as opposite to the nationalism and the neoclassicism that National Socialism had propagated only a few years ago. Hanging in the entrance hall of the first documenta, these new photographs of old images thus involuntarily formed the very avant-garde of the first documenta. And that means the avant-garde returned to Kassel in anthropological disguise. The African mask that is on the wall serves as a mask for modern art. In 1955, the anthropological turn of modernism may have appeared up to date to German visitors. But only one year later, in 1956, the Whitechapel Gallery in London presented an exhibition called This Is Tomorrow, where Richard Hamilton's robotics, his Marilyn Monroe's, his enlarged beer bottle, and actually a performing jukebox welcomed the visitors. What a contrast to Documenta's entrance hall of anthropology from the year before. In the early 50s, British pop art was already about to reopen the field of high art for cinema, pop music, applied art, consumer goods, and advertisement for collage, poster, installation, and industrial graphic methods like serigraphy. London was avant-garde in 1955 and not Kassel. In contrast, the first documenta only presented, and this important point, in contrast, the first documenta only presented two traditional academic genres, oil painting and sculpture, as you can see here in the large hall of painting. The sculptures and paintings may have been avant-garde in style, but they certainly were academicists concerning the genres. One key to the understanding of the first documenta, therefore, is that it used photographs only as educational devices and not for their artistic value, not to speak of rheographs, collages, frottages, silk, scre silk screens, or other modernist accomplishments. If the first documenta was academicist in genre, it was academicist in a pre-modern way, not in the sense of the Bauhaus, the true anti-academicist academy of modernism. Instead of including the modern genres and media as well, the first documenta re-established academicism in the traditional genres of painting and sculpture. So it comes as no surprise 
that many of the artists exhibited in the first documenta already were professors at art academies. Nearly every living German participant under 65 was teaching at an art academy, including the curator Arnold Bode. Arnold Bode was not an academicist. He certainly would have preferred to make a documenta more open to applied art, to architecture, to film, and photography. He was, so to speak, the Bauhaus man of the two curators. Obviously, it was Werner Haftmann's, the other curator's, conservative regime that shaped the first documenta as a strictly academicist enterprise as far as genres are concerned. So it is difficult to say if the avant-garde returned to Kassel as academy or if the academy returned as avant-garde. Maybe it proves that when the avant-garde returns, it is no longer avant-garde. And of course, not all of the avant-gardists were able to return because some of them had not survived. Otto Freundlich, for example, whose very sculpture had been positioned on the cover of the Munich catalog Degenerate Art, had been murdered in a concentration camp, like many other outstanding Jewish artists, Felix Nussbaum, for instance. None of them was represented in the first documenta in Kassel in 1955, nor was the magnificent Ludwig Meitner, who had survived and recently returned from his exile in Great Britain to Germany in 1953. Nor did all the political immigrants return to Kassel in 1955, neither Georges Gross, nor Hans Hoffmann, nor Josef Scharl. There was just one artist among the participants who had witnessed the concentration camp as a victim, Zoran Music. But his seven months in Dachau, in Dachau were not mentioned, were not even mentioned in the catalog's biographical entry. I'm not trying to be wiser in retrospect. I know well there were historical and personal reasons for some of the features of the first documentas that we regard as shortcomings today. I only try to sharpen the historical profile of one of the most important and influential and certainly most fascinating exhibitions of the post-war period. As one of the many West German enterprises to reconnect the post-war restoration with pre-fascist modernism, the documenta had the luck to become famous and successful. It became a myth. And even as a critical historian of the documenta, for some time I fell prey to its mythological position. But the, but the success of the documenta darkened, and still darkens, the merits of many another contemporary competitor, like, for instance, the socialist Ruhrfestspiel in Recklinghausen, made for the workers of the region and not for the international art world, or that of Wilhelm Sandberg in his Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. And it is still worthwhile to read the memories, the autobiography of Peter Aare, the founding director of the post-war Haus der Kunst, to see the documenta was not the only place where efforts were taken to rehabilitate and revitalize pre-modern art. And so I come to a last word on the exhibition design of the documenta. I think we all agree that the first modern art exhibition in terms of exhibition, the means of the exhibition, the staging of art, was the Impressionist uh, first Impressionist exhibition in Paris in 1874. There have been enormously important stations in between, like the Jahrhundertausstellung in Berlin, probably the first exhibition to be designed by a, a person who understood himself as a designer in 1906. That was Peter Behrens. We have the abstract cabinet in Hanover that Lisitsky designed for his uh, painting colleagues his abstract painting colleagues around 1927. And there is a very important book that Alexis Joachimides wrote about um, um, the uh, German museum reform, a book in which he could prove that the white wall to expose painting, that is um, the main ingredient of the white cube, of course, uh, 
was developed during the German museum reform between 1880 and 1930. And it's not by accident that the Haus der Kunst, the Haus der Deutschen Kunst had when it opened white walls. It was the color, it was the modernist color, it was the color of the enemy, but it was adopted because it proved to be flexible. So the um, chapters of this long story of modern installation of art have been enriched this morning by the brilliant lecture by Benjamin, by two chapters I would call, the first one is the invasion of typography. That is what happened on the Pressa, that is what happened in the Futurist uh, exhibitions, and this is what happened in the de Degenerate Art exhibitions. That is, different forms of typography coming from the mass media or adopting or even making a caricature of Dadaist installations, enter the exhibition space of art and begin to dominate it. And the second chap chapter that Benjamin was delivering this morning, I would call the invasion of staging in the sense of theater, dramatizing the installation, the room um, beyond, and that's important, the limits of the frames of the works or the pedestals. If we have this story in mind to which Benjamin this morning gave two decisive examples, contemporary examples, what we see, and this is my final statement of the Documenta one, that we see, what we see in this marvelous halls, marvelously designed by Arnold Bode, is a kind of purification of exhibition design. So the return of the avant-garde to Kassel was only a partial return. Thank you. Just will make a few remarks about um, the question of exile and probably more specifically on the slowly emerging subfield of exile studies, as, at least as much as I've been able to follow it in, in the United States. Um, in preparing my remarks, I remembered one of the most extraordinary statements by Emmanuel Levinas when he said, uh, each act of identification is always already an act of war. And um, thinking about the material that I presented this morning, I thought I did not get to the point when I said the enforcement of nation-state culture and the enforcement of nation-state identity did not think about its inevitable consequence that precisely because the nation state was enforced, it forced exile upon many of its members. And that, of course, is one of the historical origins of the exile that we are looking at now. But then there's a broader, more recent development, and I think we should distinguish and differentiate these various phases. The exile in response to fascist repression is not the same as the dissolution and exile or transfer that we witness now as a result of globalization. And I think that is an interesting historical spectrum to think about how nation-state cultural boundaries were initially brought down by fascism in the 1930s and how they generated what we call the culture of exile and the condition of exile for many, many thousands of people. And now we're looking at a very different historical moment where nation-state boundaries are dissolved for very, very different reasons in many different locations. So what I think is interesting is, first of all, to discuss, and I'm sure that Karen will be very helpful in this discussion, uh, is to discuss the two phases of exile formations. and. I want to quickly insert a few historical examples that also are derived partially from the work of younger people working on exile studies um, in the university uh, that I'm affiliated with. And um, this concerns the figures from the German Weimar period that emigrated to the United States and decided not to return uh, to Europe. And um, there's a broad spectrum, of course, and I can't even mention 
sufficient examples, but we can clearly think of the most famous ones in the visual arts, Joseph Albers, Laszlo moholy Nodge, um, Herbert Bayer would come to mind in the realm of um, so-called painting and culture, uh, painting and sculpture. Um, and that would be interesting in and of itself to think about. Um, then the second group, equally important, if not more important, at least from my perspective, would be the large number of women photographers who emigrate to the United States who were strangely omitted um, from the otherwise quite wonderful and important exhibition catalog that Stephanie Barron curated about 10 years ago, if I remember correctly, Exile and Emigres at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where for some reason that I have never quite understood and I haven't dared to ask her, she totally forgot, uh, and perhaps Karen can clarify this a little more, she totally forgot that there were literally hundreds, dozens, of very important German women photographers who moved to the United States and stayed in the United States or moved to Argentina and stayed in Argentina. And just to mention a few, Lotte Jacobi, um, Lisette Modell, um, to, as the two examples that come to mind, but many others should be mentioned. And of course, it's quite interesting, once again, and it seems to be almost reverberating in the reception processes that art history, that art history constructs. What Walter Grasskamp just mentioned, the peculiar delay or inability of certain institutions and certain discursive formations to recognize the actual impact of the emerging media culture of the 1920s. So what was true for Documenta and can be explained in many ways should not have been true in the 1980s in Los Angeles anymore where photography was once again obliterated by a curator or curatorial team that was totally focusing on male painting and sculpture, which is beyond my comprehension because it was 85 or 86 when the exhibition took place on, certainly not much earlier than that. So, um, so that is the second group. And then the third group is the group of writers. And of course, all of you know about this, but um, when Adorno says that he decided to return to Germany in 1947 as quickly as he possibly could return because he could not imagine ever living outside of the language. Uh, that has always struck me as one of the most extraordinary statements about um, exile culture. When other figures from the Frankfurt School, like Leo Leventhal or Herbert Marcuse, even though he was not directly a member of the Frankfurt School, did decide to stay in the United States. So you have a split there where people who were philosophers or sociologists or theoreticians felt that they could assimilate to losing the language and adopting a second language or another language and could develop their work quite productively. So that's an interesting schism as well to think about Adorno versus Marcuse. And of course, from Adorno's perspective, um, I'm sure most of you know this better than I do, um, from Adorno's perspective, Marcuse's philosophy was a totally assimilated, Americanized derivation, betrayal, decrepit forfeiture of the thinking of the Frankfurt School, right? I mean, Marcuse was, from what I recall, I haven't dealt with this in a while, Marcuse was an absolute kind of discredited figure from Adorno's perspective and Horkheimer's perspective. Um, and not because he had not returned, but he had begun to confront American culture. And that is, of course, a very interesting question. How do emigre, exile, scholars, artists, assimilate, adopt, position themselves within an American context? And I think um, there are many, many examples. As I said, Moholy, Bayer, Albers would be three figures in the visual culture that come to mind. And I think this is extremely interesting. Okay, Moholy unfortunately died very early, but Albers and Bayer are two particularly interesting figures for me because, and little work has been done to my knowledge, too little work has been done to my knowledge to really distinguish the instrumentalization of an Americanized artist from Europe as we see it in Bayer's in an extreme form and in Albers in a much more subtle form. But the scientific instrumentalization of Albers has always struck me as a typical American feature. 
which for the longest time has not been fully recognized and I think still has not been fully theorized at all. And I find it incredibly interesting to think about Albers, who is an amazing artist, but he clearly for me represents what it takes to become an American artist when you were a Bauhaus master mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And what the myth of scientificity and what the myth of technocratic assimilation and adaptation meant in order to become an American artist. And Albers, as you know, was key in the formation of Black Mountain College and then later on at Yale, and an extraordinary teacher who taught two generations, if not three generations, of American artists from Robert Rauschenberg to Eva Hesse to Richard Serra. So this is, of course, a wonderful moment of exile culture to reflect upon as well. Um, as far as exile culture studies is concerned, and I'm sure Karen can again uh, improve my report tremendously because she has done much more work on this than I have. Uh, is, this is a relatively slowly developing field um, from what I'm aware of. There's, of course, the major work by Jean-Michel Palmier. There's a major work by Susan Salomon on exile culture. There's Edward Said's extraordinary essay on, essay, on exile. And as I said, um, Sabine Ekmans and um, um, the catalog em Exile and Emigre, and individual works are now being developed. But the very theoretical challenge that emerges from the fact that a whole historical formation is transferred to a fundamentally different cultural context, uh, whether it's linguistic or whether it's visual culture or whether it's photography culture, uh, is yet another question, and how that historical confrontation is played out in each individual field. Um, the m example of Lisette Modell is very important for me. She was not German, she was Austrian, and Austro-Parisian in a sense before she immigrated, is a fantastic example where you can see how the photography of culture, photography culture of the 1920s in Europe that fully permeated Lisette Model's work is radically altered when she arrives in the United States and tries to accommodate and accommodates in the United States quite successfully. And how is it transformed? It is transformed by adopting a class that she had never seen in Europe or that was not photographable in Europe, namely the lumpen proletariat of New York, right? In Europe in the 1920s, when if you were Giselle Freund, you photographed the proletarian workers' demonstrations. That was the great project of Giselle Freund before she was forced to immigrate. When Lisette Model comes to New York, she recognizes the culture of New York does not have a proletarian mass culture anymore. The culture of New York is the culture of extreme forms of desublimation, and therefore she begins to systematically record the actual conditions of the lower classes in New York City, and then typically becomes in many ways the teacher, quite successfully so, of extraordinary importance for Diane Arbus, who continues that historical project. Um, those were some remarks. Um, I forgot to mention the, my favorite exile of all, Bertolt Brecht, of course, and the extraordinary interview that he gives at the House of Un-American Activities, and um, which is one of my utterly favorite voice recordings. I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with that at this point, I suppose you are when he's interrogated by one of the inqu inquisitors and he is confronted with the question whether he ever was a member of the Communist Party. And Bertolt Brecht, with his intensified Bavarian accent, says, I never was a member of the Communist Party. And he had a ticket in his jacket and he denounces his friend Hans Eisler, he says, I don't know what Hans Eisler did. I never had an idea that he was a member of the Communist Party. And on the grounds of his disavowal, he is let go uh, and leaves the country the next day. So that's another case of an exile that uh, ended well.
So, Karen, I think we should have a little discussion conversation with the three um, of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, th thank you so much, and I uh, think, um, not to interrupt, but I think this is really um, a very um, you know, important um, input in terms of the question of exile and categories of exile and how one can also imagine um, exile within the constructions of the narrative of exile itself. So what the exilic condition represents, both in terms of the production of art, but also its presentation, I think it's really very um, important, Benjamin, that you bring in this um, question of many women photographers who um, are yet to be recuperated, if you will. I mean, they, they're very well known, but are yet to be recuperated within the you know, general, um, you know, context of um, you know post-war, um, shall we say, reconstruction. Um, but what I wanted to sort of to, to 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 do is for you know to think about how we can tie together the three streams of presentation. Um, that we've had from Karen, Walter, and you, and which, you know, for Karen, you know, dealing with, um, you know, again, the, you know, nation state branding, you know, through this iconography of aesthetic of production um, in, um, in Paris, and the forms of identification or disidentification that may perhaps may lead to, to exile, and of course, a famous case of an unrealized uh, exile and one that haunts these conferences, Walter Benjamin, uh, in, 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 in that sense. And so this is really very you know, in, in important. And of course, um, you know, you know, Walter's provocative um, attempt at the diminution of the myth of, of documenta as sort of the grand zero of the return of the avant-garde. Of course, this is again an important question that I think these kind of revisionist histories are very important to remind us of um, even that, you know, the instability of memory at this particular, you know, point, the, the inability to, to evoke or even to say that which is obvious or to really to look at the relationship of the avant-garde to um, the liquidation of you know, European Jewry um, during this period. And of course, you know, your um, you know, you know, comment about something that I think is really fundamental, how does one you know, leave aside one's language? It's not only to, it's really how does one leave aside one's primary subjectivity? Um, this is a very, very important point the, the dimension of assimilation and inassimilation. How, uh, for Albers, you know, you're talking about the fact that it was a kind of technocratic you know, uh, insertion of this master of the, of, the, uh, of the Bauhaus into a kind of bland Americanism that, in a sense, removed or, you know, the sharpness of the, um, of the, of the work. Um, for which you know he justly became very importantly known. So with you know that said, I think now you know, it's, you know um, um, I think it's important also to see how within Europe itself the different forms of exile uh, also played out. And I remember just reading Claude Levi Strauss's *Tris Tropique*, which is really a very, very important book about exile because it begins you know, at the, on the eve of his own exile, getting on that boat, you know, Capitaine Paul Lamel, um, with you know, you know, crates of his research in Brazil, and of course, you know, he was in first class, or you know, whatever, you know, that may have meant this overcrowded boat with Breton. Um, and uh, you know, you know, uh, Victor Serge and other um, members of the European avant-garde. But just underneath, in the first class, was another figure with Fredolan. Um, 
And throughout the narrative of Tristropique where Levi Strauss um, narrates, you know, this um, moment of, of exile and of course the beginning of his own, you know, really thinking about, um, about um, not only his fate but his own Frenchness, uh, Lamb never appears anywhere. And currently in Paris, I've just created an exhibition with uh, four colleagues um, called La Triena, in which um, one of the central, you know, works, a uh, body of work um, by Lam, um, um, uh, in, um, in Canet de Massé, a, a series of drawings that, you know, in this, you know, profusion reached something like 130, you know, drawings, very small. Uh, made on this, you know, boat as it traveled from Marseille through Dakar, you know, landing in, in Martinique and of course Breton and all the rest of them continued to New York and so on. But Lamb was one of the, you know, was not allowed to enter the United States and was deported, you know, back to Cuba. So I was really, you know, very struck by this kind of you know, uh, uh, exilic, um, you know, you know, story, and of course the the way that you know Lamb himself, you know, inscribes his own, you know, um, um, location within the avant-garde by making these drawings on the board, recording, you know, passages, and of course marking it. So I just wanted to bring, you know, this other category of exile, kind of a double exile to Europe and back, and of course the inadmissibility of Lamb into the United States at this particular moment. So I'll let because you guys... As Giselle Freund was not admitted into the United States either when she tried. Right? Okay, so, yeah. just so, okay. Mean, so now we can have this you know, debate. So we have 15 minutes you know, for discussion and questions from the audience. Then we'll take a coffee break and we will start the last session 15 minutes late, just so we can stretch our legs. So, Karen? Sorry. Um, well, now with all those questions, I think I've written a second talk, so I'll, <laughs> um, I'll make choices. Um, yes, that Exile and Emigre exhibition, um, my talk didn't actually deal with Exile because the only place that that, I suppose, uh, the work I did on my topic was the fact that the uh, French authorities um, who were responsible for the the Paris Exposition um, explicitly promised the uh, officials of the Third Reich and the German ambassador that German exiles would not be able to participate anywhere in the fair. And, uh, and German exiles did organize uh, exhibitions mostly about the repression of literature and the book burnings and the French police came and closed it down um, and demanded that things be removed because the German embassy had removed. So this is, of course, when the Popular Front government's still in power. So my book, in, in part, deals with the ironies around, around that fact. Um, and uh, so that's one very specific uh, reference to the uh, exile community. Um, the other thing is this exhibition, The Exile and Emigres, which I think had to be in the mid 90s because I spoke at the, is that correct? 97, 97 thank, thank you. you. Uh, because I was invited to speak at that conference and I gave my lecture on German photographer, German female mm -hmm. photographers in exile um, uh, for that reason. Um, also specifically Gerda Tauro, who obviously died mm -hmm. um, in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, um, and in terms of the Bauhaus then, so what, so the most recent piece I've written on exile has to do with the film exhibition um, I'm curating for the Reign of Sophia, where oddly there's a disjuncture between my essay for the catalog and then the actual film program, but the essay for the catalog is in fact on filmmakers in exile, um, of which I've learned a great deal from uh, prominent scholars in the field like Thomas L. Salser and Lutz Kopnik, um, who, have, who have helped frame, I think, the issues around um, exile and American mass culture in some very productive ways, which um, there's of course a great deal of loss, um, 
the disruption of personal lives, careers, loss of relatives, loved ones. Um, they also then look at what happens um, when the, um, and this is what I deal with in my essay, um, a renegotiation about the relationship between modernism and mass culture that is in a sense forced upon uh, uh, avant-garde figures from, from, uh, from Nazi, uh, from the Europe, and, um, and how that then ends up uh, being very influential. Um, I deal with both poetic realism in, in uh, France, uh, because that's often a first stop for many exiled filmmakers, and then obviously in Hollywood, um, and then also I deal with this, because this is something that connected to the problem I had at the Exile and Emigre conference, and again, this is pushing my memory now um, over a decade, but uh, there's an excellent scholar named Hamid Nafisi. I don't know if any of you know his work on, it's mostly on uh, post-colonial cinema and notions of uh, exile and how he actually looks at the aesthetic properties of film and finds ways that the condition of exile have actually influenced the structure and narratives and it creates a virtual lexicon of um, this works. And he relates it to the exile situation um, of the Second World War. And the problem I had at that conference was that everyone was talking about the uh, history of, of uh, exile um, around World War II as now explaining our global condition of always being nomadic, of always uh, being in exile because of our alienation from, um, from the real through the mediation of mass culture. And uh, I, again, I had a terribly hard time with the, his, uh, the lack of historical specificity and the real sort of material and artistic conditions uh, that were kind of withdrawn from, from those parallels. Uh, but yes, I think uh, not only is exile used as a metaphor for what I think is uh, often horribly simplified notion of what globalization means today, but it's also become, in a sense, a metaphor for cinema itself um, with the this disjunctures of montage because montage continues to be this ghost uh, that so much is read into the, the uh, aesthetic structures of montage, not just through film, but um, this also obviously came up, came up in uh, Georges' uh, talk. Um, anyway, so I don't want to take okay. up more time. Um, I'm very sure there are many, many questions, but again, I would like, um, just as you collect your thoughts, um, if, you, you know, if you have any questions, you know, please raise your hand, but if you don't, oh, okay, there are questions already, okay. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, go here, mm -hmm. and, and then, Two over there. Hi, uh, this is to Karen Fiss. Earlier you had mentioned that you just wanted to, I'm curious about your observations on, uh, you had talked about the redefining of banality. I figured that would come back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, basically, uh, this is something that I've uh, been thinking about in the past couple of months, that the way that banality or the conditions of banality as was originally brilliantly uh, identified and illustrated by Hannah Arendt um, have been replaced by, I would say, a more post-Baudrillard notions of banality um, with simulacra and sensation sensationalism and, uh, and there's a real confusion and I find that deployed often when actually trying to deal with issues around representation of horror um, and in the context I've been speaking in um, around national socialism. So, and also as, as exhibition technique. So I think that's something that began to come up at the end of the last session. Okay, over there. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I have two short remarks, maybe three. Um, the first is that it's worth uh, looking at the crossroads between the emigres, the roots of the emigres, and the self-representation of the official German 
uh, Germany, and I think of the emigres who were in Paris during the fair, like Paul Westheim, Walter Benjamin, Giselle Freund, and maybe some of them could have reacted on the exhibition or... Um, they did, this. yeah. And That's... this is one thing, and the other thing is that it is, would be worth, it's a remark to Walter Grasskamp, to think about why some emigres succeeded in returning or in being visible after 1945 and some not. And I think one important fact is the network and um, <coughs> to have a good network to be promoted. And I think of um, Josh Gross and Rudolf Belling, who's exhibited here, who tried to return from Istanbul and did not succeed. And maybe Martin Wagner, who was not able to um, be more influential. And the third is um, Access Studies in Germany. We at the Institute of Art History in Munich, we are preparing an online lexicon about emigre artists. And I hope uh, we will begin next year with it. Okay. Um, interesting that you mention uh, him. I know his daughter, who's now in her 80s. She's really interesting in San Francisco. The, she actually grew up in Istanbul, and then she and her mother got to New York, but not her father. Um, so yes, yeah, so in terms of the exiles in Paris, um, uh, I didn't have time to address uh, the writings, but Paul Westheim, for example, wrote in the Neue Weltbühne about the German pavilion. Um, he obviously denigrated the uh, architectural style that Speer had uh, brought together, saying that he had con it looked like he had simply kind of played with uh, cigar boxes and stacked them next to each other. And then he also compares it to a crematoria. <laughs> and he says that the tower looked like the smokestack of the crematoria, and the vitrines um, were the sarcophagi. And he also talks about the tower as the antechamber, and it's all very, uh, uh, a lot of foreshadowing in his uh, analysis. Um, and then obviously there were the exhibitions that uh, Paul Vestheim made. Those were all tied to what they thought they were going to do in London, and then that fell through. So those exhibitions, um, which uh, my colleague Keith Holtz has written um, some very interesting work on those, uh, his book uh, on German exiles in Paris, London, and New York, um, has a lot of really useful uh, historical information on that. Um, to the second part of the question, um, the network of art, of course, is the market. And the influence on Documenta, the influence of the market on Documenta was strong from the beginning. And only few people know that the first Documenta was a sales exhibition. You could buy these pieces of art there, and they have been sold there. Um, of course, this was not an art fair. It was more... Um, um, trying to convince German museum directors what they had to buy and what they did in Kassel, actually. A lot of the pieces you find in German museums have been bought there or first been seen there. Um, this is one, of the, one part of the answer. Um, it was good for an artist to return to Germany to have a gallery that was proposing it in Kassel, a successful gallery. Uh, the second is, of course, it's intertwining biographies of two very different personalities, like Bode and Huffman were. This is one of the success formula of First Documenta, that we have two very different biographies. And whoever had been intertwined with these biographies had a good chance to come to Documenta 1. And I think that, um, more than ever, I think that the influence of Werner Huffman on the profiling the Documenta was so much stronger than we expected, because um, Arnold Bode was more or less um, concentrating on the, on the display. Um, in the papers of uh, Arnold Bode, we find early sketches for Documenta, and there was Georges Gross included. It must have been discussed. And he was favored by uh, Arnold Bode because he wanted to bring emigrants f back f from, not with their persons, but with personal life, but with their works at least. And I think that this was um, not the, um, something that uh, Werner Haftmann would have favored, who was more than conservative. Um, so this is the second part of the answer. The third part of the answer is there was no research done, of course. Uh, 
if research had been done, um, they would have found Ludwig Meitner. Ludwig Meitner, who is more or less forgotten nowadays, was um, highly estimated by the early expressionists. Ernst Ludwig Kirchner called him the most expressionist painter of us all. And he was living for two years already in Germany, so research, if it had been done, he would have been found. Um, these three parts of the answers. If I may, something to, um, that struck me with your um, lecture is, um, if, if I can resume it roughly, in the 19th century, we have two um, very important splits. The first split is between art and applied art. Um, art still was called art afterwards, was called high art, or in Germany, pure art, which is a highly difficult notion, pure art. And the other half was applied art first, and it was design or gestalt or whatever. Um, and these two branches, uh, th this was branching out into different businesses first. The second split was between the architect and the engineer. The engineer responsible for, statistics, for statics, for material procedures and all, uh, all the rest. And so we have split between the artist who becomes a pure artist and the applied artist, between the architect and between the engineer. And it struck me as a bad joke of history that two uh, advanced um, enterprises to reunite them failed. One was the Bauhaus and the other was the German Pavilion. Oh, yeah. Well, and there's obviously continuities. I mean, Lotz... There's no reconciliation po well, Lotz possible. Lotz used to edit the journal for the Werkbund, right? You know, and yeah. so, I mean, so it... I mean, he's the one I was quoting, so there's... Okay. Yeah. Benjamin, you have it, uh, yeah, I had a question uh, for Walter, if I may. Yeah. 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 Or yeah, are we yeah. running out of time? Wait, wait. No, 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 yeah. Yeah, please. Um, I th thought it was very fascinating what you told us about Documenta. Many questions that I've often wondered about were answered. But there's one additional set of questions. Um, whether the selection, even if it was Bode and Haftmann as two different people, ultimately ends up pretty homogeneous, as you described very well. And um, the many exclusions are obvious, but um, I always thought there's a, an element of shame in the first documenta, in the sense that all the political artists of Weimar who were alive, let's say Hannah Hirsch, John Hartfield, and many others, are not even considered. And I think it has not just to do with the fact that Bode and Haftmann were obviously mentally slightly incapacitated to understand the avant-garde of the 1920s. I'm sorry to say so because it does deserve a harsher commentary, right? I mean, it was possible in 1955 to remember John Hartfield. You had to repress John Hartfield. It was possible to go to Berlin and visit Hannah Hirsch because she was living right there and you could have talked to her, right? So I think there was a phobia to engage with the Dada legacy and with the leftist artist culture legacy of the 1920s, first out of shame, and second, shame in terms of saying, these are forms of political art we can no longer risk to get involved with because we have just overcome the politicization of art on the extreme right, and we have destroyed our own leftist history, and out of shame we will not acknowledge that we have destroyed our own avant-garde. I think that is a mechanism that contribute to the pictorialization of Documenta One yeah. in a major way. And so don't you think a, the Green, I mean Greenberg's, I mean the yeah. dominance of Greenberg would have also yeah. uh, determined and that? Typical example, just one, went mm. a long time ago, I did an interview with Gerhard Richter, one of many, and I asked him, what did you think of John Hartfield when you lived in the DDR? And he said, I hated him. He was the quintessential enemy for me. I said, didn't you learn photography insertion from Hartfield? No, I hated him. I never knew about him. I learned photomontage from Robert Rauschenberg, right? I mean, that is the precise condition of that historical moment of the transition from Documenta 1 to Documenta 2, when exile culture is overcome suddenly in the second Documenta with this manifest, massive embrace of American art, which is probably another lecture and another topic that we can't address now. So. There's a question over okay. there. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, I have a question to Professor Grascomb. Um, coming back to um, 
this, uh, to me, very, very interesting aspect that you gave us, um, that asking how, it, how was it possible for the avant-garde to come back and that the curators at that time choose uh, the link of anthropology um, so that it came back in form of anthropology and um, giving all the historical situation that to me sounds like a very yeah, interesting link. And um, claiming that anthropology, that art is an, an anthropological constant. And now my question is addressing a very, <laughs> a very um, small um, thing in your speech, which you might, uh, um, which might uh, be far too large to, uh, to discuss here in, in completely. But then you said um, you doubt that it is. And I was somehow curious about these doubts of yours. You might have made a wise decision not to go too deeply into that <laughs> question. Yes. But still, I just wanted to mention that this just struck me and I wanted to place this question. It was a wise decision not to go deeper into this question. <laughs> <laughs> but I would go, but this is a different lecture. I, I, I would gladly give to you any occasion coming because it is one of the problems of the notion of global art and world art still yeah. today. It's yes. still surviving in blurred notions of over-expanding the notion of art. Okay. <coughs> but uh, what I would say to, to Benjamin's um, argument is um, nowadays we would expect that the discussions of the curators were in the internet and we can follow them. Mm -hmm. um, we have no, absolutely no um, testimony of the um, discussions, mm -hmm. except that they were very furious. The uh, Documenta Commission was, was famous for uh, confronting people with different missions in art. We only have the papers of Bode, uh, and po uh, Bode was not a writing man, mm -hmm. it was just sketches and, and names he drew. Um, but to show how um, far apart they were is of course necessary to, to remember that um, Bode planned seriously to invite for his society that was called exit Occidental Art of the 20th Century. And Abendland, of course, is a notion that goes far more than mm -hmm. a geographical notion. Um, for um, a lecture to his Occidental society of 20th century, Bert Brecht. And the letter was written. So he was eager to um, to uh, reconstruct the, the uh, pre-war um, um, constellations, even knowing that Brecht would have been appear, regarded as a communist propagandist mm -hmm. in Kassel if it had worked, if, he, if it would have been possible to come. And the other hint is Georges Gross that mm -hmm. was on his list. Um, and I think it's one of the um, um, disadvantages that Bode, for my opinion, adopted too early the um, Werner Haftmann's mm -hmm. scheme of modern art that had a thesis, and the thesis of the first documenta, although you see abstract paintings on the walls, was the continuity of the expressionist, and only the second had the um, abstraction as a world art. And Haftmann, as a man of a thesis, and as a, um, a skilled, um, skilled in argumentation, I think uh, marginalized uh, the social democrat border. Um, and it's a pity, but um, it would have been different, um, and it would have been a, a, in, different in names and different in genres if this was more balanced in, to Bode's favor. But we can only speculate about this. Mm -hmm. It's just two names we know, but many others may have been mentioned in the discussions, and Hannah Hirsch, of course, was one of them. Mm -hmm. But it's necessary to know also that the first Dada exhibition um, was in the Rhineland, in 1964, and the minister in Dusseldorf, earlier. yeah, no, 64 or 62, maybe 62, but not earlier as 62, and the minister. No, it was earlier. You sure? Yeah, because that's, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it was 58 or 59. Are you sure? Very early. Okay, yeah. right, I'm not sure. But <laughs> what I'm sure about is that the minister in um, responsibility for um, public education. Mm -hmm. um, was um, short of closing it down because mm -hmm. it was still felt as a prov provocation, not in terms of politics, mm 
but as a kind of a, a branch of Absolutely. art that led to nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, before you discuss it politically, it was just leading nowhere. Um, and of course, there is no Duchamp at, at the first documenta. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole range of Dadaism they were shy of. That I would mm -hmm. uh, agree with, yeah. Um, we are surprisingly at 5.15. And um, so we've miraculously hit that point. So um, please uh, help me thank the panelists uh, who are still continuing their conversation uh, for this wonderful session.